this API is now running in a completely serverless way. When this API isn't processing any requests, it's costing us absolutely nothing. Zero. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another video on modernizing your .NET Framework applications to run with AWS serverless compute. In this video, we're going to have a look at one of the most common types of .NET applications, and that is a web API. What we've got here to begin with is a .NET Framework web API that you would typically need to run on a Windows server using IIS. And we're going to take that, we're going to modernize that to modern.net and run that API on AWS Lambda. Let's have a look at the API that we have to begin with. And it's a really simple API just for the purposes of this first video. In a future video, we're going to have a look at a more complicated example that has database connections, configuration secrets, and all of that fun stuff. What we've got is a simple API that has a static dictionary of values, and we've got some CRUD operations that we can use to operate on that dictionary. We can retrieve the entire dictionary, get a specific item in the dictionary, add, update, and delete your typical CRUD-based API, all against an in-memory dictionary of values. And let's start that up in IIS now using Visual Studio the debugger, and we can actually run some requests against that API. If I flick over to Postman for a second and I hit a get request on this API, we've got our initial values that were configured here when the values controller was created. I can then run a post request against that, and if I pass in a body of hello, that will then give me a 204 response. And then if I flick back to my get request, I will have a new item in my dictionary now with the next available ID. And of course, I can get a specific record, which will also give me hello. This is a really simple example, but we'll use this to demonstrate how we can take this to AWS Lambda. And if we have a look at the properties of this project now, we have got a framework um, 472 API. The first thing we're going to do, like we did in the last video, is we're going to use the porting assistant for .NET to port this application from .NET Framework over to modern .NET. And you can see before I've started recording this video, I've gone ahead and actually ran that port. And I've done that because in the previous video in this series talking about Windows servers, we had a bit more of a deep dive into porting the system. In this video, I've skipped over that just to speed things up a little bit, but I've added my .NET Framework project to porting assistant. I've hit the port solution button at the top here, and then I've got a .NET 6 version of my application. Once that project has finished porting, we can then add that to Visual Studio, and the observant amongst you will have seen that the .NET 6 project has been there since the start. And again, much of this code is exactly the same as it was in the .NET Framework world. I've deleted a couple of folders here. I've got rid of my scripts folder. I've got rid of some of my views and my models just because the base .NET Framework project includes some MVC pieces, whereas I just want a pure web API. So I have deleted a couple of things but actually the bulk of the application is exactly the same. My startup class is the same. My program.cs file is exactly the same. My value controller has a couple of changes to it, but it's almost exactly the same. The things I've had to change once I've modernized this application, the porting assistant will just take your .NET Framework application, it'll upgrade the code, it'll upgrade any NuGet references, and then you'll get the same application, but with .NET 6. But actually, the way you define an API in .NET 6 is slightly different to how we do it in .NET Framework. If we just have a look back at our .NET Framework version, you see all we actually got is this values controller class that inherits from API controller. And then we just go through and define all our methods. 
in .NET 6, we actually need to annotate some of our roots to actually allow them, the, the uh, ASP.NET, to know what roots to use. You see, at the top here, we've got the actual base root for our API itself. And we've also inherited from the controller base class as opposed to the API controller. When we get into our actual endpoint methods now, you can see again, we've got these slightly different annotations here. We've got a HTTP get method, and then we've got a second get method passing in the ID. Now, the paths that we specify in these annotations will always run from the path we set at the top here. So the path for this get method will be slash API slash values, whereas the path for the one with the ID will be slash API slash values slash five, for example. And if we look through the rest of this controller code, you can see we've got our post, we've got our put, and we've got our delete. So the actual application code itself is exactly the same, but we've just added these additional annotations so that ASP.NET knows how to route our requests. And if I just set my .NET 6 version as my startup class, we can then have a look at this actually executing. If we just run that, .NET 6 version of the API in Visual Studio now. And that will start just like that. Then if I flip back over to Postman and we hit a get request there, it's on a slightly different URL, we get our get our response back there for one and two. And again, we can do our same post. I can post to that. I'll get hello, get my 204 response. Excellent. And then if I hit I get request, I get hello, I get response. This application now is functionally exactly the same, but it's running with .NET 6 instead of .NET Framework. It's incredibly fast to upgrade your projects if you're using the porting assistant. And I'd really recommend if you're just getting started on this modernization journey, the first step to take is just run porting assistant against your existing code base. That will give you a really data-driven approach to look up the work required to upgrade your application. So next steps now, let's have a look how we can run this in Lambda. And to do that, we're gonna use a NuGet package provided by AWS called the Amazon Lambda ASP.NET Server Hosting. So if I just search for Amazon Lambda ASP, I want this Amazon Lambda ASP.NET Core Server. I'm going to install that to my .NET 6 project now to accept all of them ports there. So when we're running applications on Lambda, Lambda needs an entry point. Lambda needs a way in, and that typically is specified using a namespace, a class, and a method name. We don't really have that in our startup and our program CS files. This is this is made perfectly specifically to start up locally. What I'm actually going to do is add an additional class to my project now to hold this Lambda entry point. And we can call this whatever we want, but I'm actually going to call it something nice and memorable. I'm going to call it Lambda entry point. And this is the point in which Lambda will enter our application. And once I've got this Lambda entry point class, we now need to make this inherit from something. And it's going to inherit from a base class provided by the Amazon Lambda ASP.NET Core Server. And we're actually going to front this with a API Gateway HTTP API V2 proxy function. Yes, that's a little bit of a mouthful. But this is part of a set of classes provided by this library that allow us to front this Lambda function with different API providers. So we've got the API Gateway HTTP APIs, we've got API Gateway REST APIs, and we've also got Application Load Balancers. These are the three APIs that you can put in front of AWS Lambda. And the reason this base class differs is because the payload that gets passed to Lambda differs. What this is going to do behind the scenes is it's going to take that JSON payload that comes into Lambda translate that to a form that ASP.NET understands and pass that request to ASP.NET and then do the same on the way back out with the response. And of course, these, these payloads, these JSON payloads that come to Lambda are different based on what we're putting in front of Lambda, which is why we need a different base class. 
we're going to put this Lambda function behind API Gateway HTTP API, which means we need to inherit from the HTTP API v2 proxy function. And the second thing we can do here is we're going to override this init method. And we're going to override the init method for this iWebHost builder. And this then allows us to tell Lambda how to do startup. So I can do builder dot use startup and I can pass in my startup class. Now at the point when Lambda starts up this application, it knows which startup class to use. And this can be the exact same startup class that our application uses when it runs locally or it runs in a container. We actually don't need to change any of this existing code. We can just add this new Lambda entry point class, inherit from one of the base classes in the Amazon Lambda ASP NetCore server NuGet package. And then we can just override the init method to tell Lambda which startup class to use. If we wanted to, we could put some Lambda specific code in here. You know, we could say builder.use Let's say we wanted to use static web assets when we're running in Lambda. We could add some custom configuration here that's specific to Lambda. But we're not going to do that. We're going to use the exact same startup class that we had in our normal API. And this is everything we need now to run this API on Lambda. All we've done is added this one additional class, and this is ready to go. And let's go ahead and deploy this now using... AWS SAM. I've already gone through the trouble of creating a SAM template ready for us to use, and we can have a look at that. Now, there's some slightly different things that you need to do when you're deploying an entire API on Lambda using this Lambda entry point way of doing things. The first is when we specify our handler, and we've got the handler specified there. Now, you can see that the actual way we're specifying this handler is pretty much the same as we normally would. We've got our namespace here, which is webapi.net6. We've got our class here, which is webapi.net6 lambda entry point. Remember, that was the custom class that we added. And then we've got this function handler async method here. If we just have a look back at our Lambda entry point, you see we don't actually have a function handler async method defined here. And that's because that method comes from our base class. And all of the different base classes all have this function handler async method. And that is where the magic happens. It's within that method that the ASP.NET server gets started, that the translation happens between the input from the JSON payload from the Lambda event source into something that ASP.NET understands. So that's the first important bit, the actual handler itself that we have there. Second important thing when you're running entire APIs on Lambda in this way is with this events section and very specifically the path and the method we've defined there. You see, we've defined our path as slash proxy plus and this is a special path you can have on API Gateway APIs that tells API Gateway to pass all requests onto that same integration that's specified on that route. And of course, because we're specifying the method as any, that is also for any methods. What API Gateway is going to do is for any request that hits this API, it's going to pass the entire payload onto our Lambda function and all of the routing will happen within our API. We're letting ASP.NET handle the routing, and API Gateway is simply just functioning as a proxy, passing all requests onto our API. If we flick over to a terminal window now, we can then go off and deploy this application. If I run a SAM build from within the same folder as my SAM template, this will now tell SAM to go off and build the application that has finished building now and I can then do a SAM deploy and if this was the first time I was deploying I could pass in the guided flag I've already deployed this previously so I can just run a SAM deploy and this will tell AWS SAM to go off and actually deploy our application I've already done the first deploy prior to recording this video so this shouldn't actually take too long at all to deploy. There we are. 
and we've had our API Gateway endpoint kicked out here. So if I grab a copy of that API endpoint and I flick over to my browser window and let's actually hit that API endpoint. And of course, on the route, we don't actually get a response because our API doesn't actually have any controllers on the route. If we have a look at our values controller again, you can see our route is slash API slash values. If I go back to my API and I go slash API slash values, there we have our response. And you can see just how fast this is. That first request, when I hit the route, that was a cold start, but it still returned quickly. And then when I hit my actual endpoints now, this is just as fast as ASP.NET always has been, always will be. Let's just check some of our other routes so we can actually get our specific value. And then if we flick back over to Postman, let's just check that our post request works as well. So if I hit a post on my API, that's returned a 200 OK. Come back to my browser window and I now have hello as well. This API is now running in a completely serverless way. When this API isn't processing any requests, it's costing us absolutely nothing. Zero. And all we've done is just ported this API from .NET Framework to .NET 6 using the AWS porting assistant for .NET. We've made a couple of code changes just to meet some of the requirements of modern .NET that differ to .NET Framework. And we've just added one single additional class to our project. And that gives us all the functionality we need to run this API on AWS Lambda. Now, I know you're probably thinking, James, that's a really simple example. Nobody's doing in-memory dictionaries as their entire API in the real world. And I hear you say that. So in the next video, we're going to have a look at a more complete example that uses things like Entity Framework to talk to a SQL database that loads connection strings from secrets stores. But for this video, that is all I've got for you. I hope you found this useful and you've seen just how easy it is to make, take your .NET Framework applications and run them in a completely serverless way on AWS. As always, if you've liked this video, please like, please subscribe, and I will see you all next time.